um, week of transition for our family, our youngest daughter. You may know this if you saw my Facebook or Instagram today, but our youngest daughter started college on Monday, which is so exciting for us. My niece started college and uh, in Middle Tennessee, where we live, students are back to school. School buses are going. We're having to plan our morning traffic routes around school buses again. So uh, I don't think we mentioned it last week, but I pray that uh, if you are local or wherever you're tuning in from, if you have children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews that are back in school, uh, whatever grade they're in, or if you're the one back to school, praying that um, it is smooth, adjusting. I know it's always a little bumpy getting back used to those rhythms after summertime, but uh, I know I saw lots of posts on my feed of dorm room, you know, dorm rooms getting, you know, filled up and uh, kids with their backpacks on. So uh, if that applies to your season, we pray as our families are adjusting that your family is adjusting well too. And we're almost out of that season of um, having kids go to school. Uh, we, we, we have graduated from elementary school, middle school, high school. Thank you, Lord. So we, we, yes. have, we have done yes. our duty. Yes, we have. We have paid our dues. And um, we're, uh, now we're, we've got the final one in college. <laughs> Again, we, we enjoyed all those seasons, but, but we're glad to be out of them. Okay? Uh, so for those of you who are still in them, may God's grace rest upon you. <laughs> we're, we're not empty nesters just yet, but we're not going to be sad when we become empty nesters. We, I, I, our belief system is we raise them up to send them out. We raise them up to send them out. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. <laughs> so yeah, they, they need to live their lives, you know? I didn't mean you had to say the amen. Oh, oh, my bad. <laughs> I meant from our folks who are watching. Okay, yeah, man. <laughs> Your sister Kathy said, yup. <laughs> <laughs> You've been there, Kathy, and done that. And I just saw your sweet post of your grandbaby. So yes, I know grandparents are um, encouraging. And I just saw a neighbor in the grocery store whose family's about to move out of town to be near their grandchildren and so lots of uh transitions going on job transitions for some and so anyway it's uh it's it's that season amen and it's bible study season it it's is. bible study time so if you're on our mailing list you receive notes from us that we send out to um the the, the people of strong tower and so if you don't have the notes follow along with us get a pad a, a pen because as we try to practice every week, uh, Bible study happens best when we have an open mind, an open heart, and an open Bible. Um, open mind because we all have presuppositions, biases. We all tend to think we know everything there is to know about a particular topic or passage, uh, when in reality, again, we're still learning, all of us. We, we never can exhaust the scriptures. So we have to have an open mind and of course an open heart because the condition of the heart will determine whether or not the seed of the word of God that is being sown will register and produce fruit in our lives. If our hearts are hard, if our hearts are, are formed already, if there's something going on where we're struggling with the, the issues of life, it can choke the word and cause the word not to do what it was sent forth to do. And that is to go down deep in order to come up out of our lives producing fruit. So open heart, open mind and open Bible. I read from, we read from the New King James Version. Tonight I will refer to the New International Version. I just pray that you have a Bible in front of you and that you take notes. Uh, with that being said, I'll open in a word of prayer. Amen. This Amen. is week three of the sexual healing series at Strong Tower Bible Church. As we're going to review what was preached this past Sunday, we're going to preview what's coming this Sunday. And in between, we're going to answer some of the questions that came in by text and even read some of the comments that have come in. So that's how we're doing it right now on Wednesday online here from the kitchen table at the Williamson Home in Franklin, Tennessee. So, all right, open heart, open mind, open Bible. Let's talk to the Father. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn a little bit more about you. 
I thank you, God, that you have not called us to try to acquire this understanding in and of ourselves, because, Lord, that would be impossible. The only way we can understand spiritual things is with the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be our teacher, that you would be our guide, that you would be the one who would take the things of God and make them make sense to us. Work in us to want what you have for us and then to do what you have for us. Holy Spirit, lead us, we pray, into all truth this evening. Lord, help me as the teacher, help Darina as the teacher to see things even as we're sharing that we didn't see as we studied and labored over the word and even prayed on our knees. Show us something fresh this evening that we may have never seen before. Your word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces down deep. Um, and Lord, I, it is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So God, we, 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 we say have your way tonight, especially on this topic that can create so much confusion, sorrow, sadness, uh, even division in the body of Christ. But Lord, I pray that you would heal us all. As it says in the word of God, that you sent your word and you heal the people. Lord, heal us tonight. We need a healing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, last Sunday, uh, I preached a message called The Power of Lust. And um, we came from the Sermon on the Mount that's found in Matthew chapter five, uh, chapter six and chapter seven, where it begins by saying Jesus sat down. I want to read that to you. Matthew chapter five, beginning at verse one, it says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, mm -hmm. his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. So Jesus taught his disciples. Um, the essence of being a disciple is that you are a student, that you are a learner, that you are a pupil. The Greek word mathetes means just that, that you are there to learn. Jesus is the teacher and he is there and he is here to teach. And in this particular episode, he taught sitting down. So on Sunday mornings, I'm in good company trying to imitate my master by sitting down to teach the good people of Strong Tower Bible Church. And in this case, he, he teaches a sermon that has at least 25 different topics in it. So when you read uh, the Sermon on the Mount, it's tough to read it in one setting because your mind can go so many places thinking about what he's talking about. And so, so there's so many topics he hits. Can you imagine uh, on a Sunday, if your pastor got up and said, um, I've got 25 points today <laughs> in my sermon, I got, I got 25 points today. You, you would have trouble. <laughs> we would have trouble with that, right? <laughs> um, but that, that's not how they preached back then. You know, they, he sat on the, on the mountain top and he, he preached to them. And one of the topics he covered was the topic of lust of lust, how lust can be a dangerous and crippling thing in our lives and especially in the life of a married couple because Jesus um, talks about lust in the context of adultery, which is what we got into on Sunday, talking about the power of lust. And Darina, uh, you, you were wanting to maybe comment on that thing where we confuse lust and love. Yes, I love the analogy you gave that they're both four letter words that begin with L. And so people get them confused. Uh, one is constructive and the other is destructive. But then later on in your sermon, you talked about how um, lust or, or another word that we might use similar desire, you know, that there are times in the Bible that that word is used, um, you know, like. In a positive in, in a light. In a positive light, you know. So again, you know, the, the two get confused sometimes that, that mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm in lust. We say we're in love, but really we're in love. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because lust is going to involve passion. Love involves passion. Um, lust can be positive as far as in the Greek language. We don't necessarily 
use lust in the English language to speak of things that are positive. It's usually, it usually denotes negativity. But in the Greek language and in that world, that word epithemia could speak of a strong desire or passion like Jesus had to eat the Passover with the disciples or a strong desire or passion that a, a person may have to want to become a pastor, an elder in the church if you have that desire. So it, it all depends again on the context, but by and large in the Bible, when lust is used or, or translated from the Greek into the English, by and large, it's speaking of an illicit sexual desire. It's something that is um, not favorable in scripture, not good. So when Jesus is preaching this, this is just one of those discipleship moments. Everything is a discipleship moment. Everything is a teachable moment. And how many folk know that when the Lord teaches you, sometimes, if not every day, he gives you a pop quiz. <laughs> what you think, babe? Mm. <laughs> He'll give you a pop quiz. Uh, uh, you know, we, sometimes we know when the exam is coming, when the test is coming at the end of the semester, midway through the semester, but every now and then your professor, your teacher, he or she will roll up in the classroom and say, we have a pop quiz today. And I have to let you know, my wife and I have gone through several pop quizzes today. <laughs> okay. And so we have to trust the Lord that when he gives a quiz, it's a quiz that we can pass. He doesn't give you a quiz to set you up to fail. Mm. He gives you a quiz to set you up to succeed. Now it's going to stretch you like all get out, but he sets you up to grow. That's all he, he wants us to grow. And we don't grow without tests and pop quizzes. Lord have mercy. Can all the teachers say amen? <laughs> amen. Can all the students say ouch? Woo, my God. Well, the first point Sunday, I talked about the letter of the law from Matthew 5, 27, where Jesus said, let's see here, Matthew 5, 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. So here Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament or from the 10 commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery is the seventh commandment. It's in the second half of the Decalogue. The first half of the Decalogue deals with our relationship with God. The second half deals with our relationship with one another. And so he's quoting from this passage. And in that day, as we talked about on Sunday, go listen to the message. We, we can't give it all to you. But um, there were people who believed that they kept the law. There were people who believed that they were perfect. And so Jesus had to remind his people that, no, you're not perfect. There's none righteous. No, not one. He is the only perfect one. And, uh, and so the law, uh, the letter of the law was used to set us up to look for grace. It was a setup for our heads to look up for God to send deliverance. The law is good. The law is perfect, but we can't keep it as fallen individuals. But there were people who said, well, because I'm not committing the act of adultery, I'm holier and better than other people. I know y'all don't know people like that, but there were people who would say that, you know, the rich young ruler, when Jesus gave the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying in the temple, they both had the audacity to say that they had not sinned or that they had kept the law since their youth. And so Jesus says, okay, let, let me reach this audience by not just dealing with the letter of the law, but by dealing with the spirit of the law. Because a lot of you guys can say, I haven't committed adultery. But how many of you guys can say, I've never lusted? None of us. None of those men back then. And Dorina, now I, I'm throwing something in. She doesn't know this is coming. Okay, we, we, we kind of go over what we're going to talk about tonight. So she's probably like, what is he about to say? But in John chapter 8, when the woman was caught mm -hmm. in adultery, yeah. the Pharisees were testing Jesus because they wanted to see him say that this woman should be stoned, right? But he said, whoever is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, and they walked away. Jesus showed great wisdom in that situation. But the, I think you brought this up a couple of weeks ago, and that is, how do you catch someone in adultery without another person? You, you just have one person. 
And 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 and, and how only, do you catch them in adultery? And you didn't see any. So you you knew that they were there, and you walked in with your eyes closed. Hey, y'all need to stop right. adultery right now. So, so they were voyeurs. Eat. They were voyeurs. They were watching this setup. They set this whole thing up. So these are the same guys who say they don't commit adultery, though, but they're setting up adultery and they're watching adultery take place. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when they brought the woman to Jesus, did they say, OK, you go put some clothes on because you're going to come with us? Mm. So, yeah, it's it's yeah, it, it's a mess. It's so a Jesus mess. is speaking to the spirit of that crowd. And here's the thing about the law. In Galatians 324, Paul said that the law was our tutor to lead us to Jesus Christ. The law says, man, you can't keep me. But Jesus kept the law. He fulfilled the law, Matthew 5, 17. And then the good news is he died for lawbreakers like you and me. So this is the good news. This is the gospel. We're not under the condemnation that the law brings. Uh, we are under grace because Jesus set us free. He died for us and he lived the life we couldn't live. And then we went on into the second point after that, about the look of lust. Uh, 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 uh. Um, Matthew 5, 28, you read, but I say to you, this is Jesus' words, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And, uh, you know, it was easy for people, and you alluded to this already, to become self-righteous because they have not committed the act of adultery, but Jesus talked about the intent of looking at a woman lustfully, um, that that's the equivalent of committing adultery um, mm. in your heart. And and the Bible describes the strong desire of lust often as a sexually illicit desire. Mm. Um, I, you know, what I loved about this point is that, you know, so often today people want to make Jesus so sweet and so palatable and, and so shallow. He's just mm. love. We mm. just want to talk about that characteristic of Jesus. But when I see this Jesus, the Matthew 5 Jesus, I see a Jesus who was like, hey, y'all want to say I haven't committed adultery, but I'm coming down your block and saying if you lusted, that's the same thing. It's just as sinful. And so this is not a soft Jesus. This is a Jesus who took it deeper to the intent of the heart, which is the, the equal, equal equivalent out for everybody. Um, you know, so, the Bible talks about how our hearts are bare before the Lord. Right. So he knows what's in our hearts and the things that are in our heart that defile us, Jesus said, are just as sinful as the acts themselves. They're just as offensive to God. Now that doesn't mean that since it's in my heart, I need to go out and do it, you know? No, no, since it's in my heart, I need to repent of it before I do it. Oh, somebody ought to say amen and write that down. Check ourselves. Because I don't know if I can say it again. Right. But but man, it's in my heart and I need to repent of it before I go out and actually do the act. Mm -hmm. Because in my heart, it's bad. But outside of my heart and doing something with someone that is forbidden, man, that is destructive. Uh, I once heard it said that, uh, 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 how, how's it go? Oh, boy. <clears> hmm. <throat> I can't think of it right now. It'll come to me. Something about jams and fruit, lust, something. It, okay. It'll come to me okay. later. But anyway, anyway, well, anyway. the final piece in in your second point about the look of lust is that acknowledging this is so important because acknowledging a person's beauty is natural. So some of us grew up thinking that oh, if I look over and I see a handsome man, oh my gosh, I sin. And so you know, you gave the analogy of Rachel, how the Bible describes her in Genesis nine twenty seven at uh, nine seventeen rather. Um, as being beautiful in form. So, you know, there's all these specific instances of the Bible specifically speaking of someone as beautiful. The same um, was described of Joseph in Genesis 39 and, and how Adam and Eve, uh, before they sinned, their eyes were satisfied in each other within the confines of mm -hmm. marriage. But after they sinned, you know, their eyes weren't satisfied, as is human. You know, Proverbs 27 yeah. about the eyes of man are never satisfied. And then the other point you gave that was so powerful was how, you know, so often men are... Are, are criticized more uh, for the sin of lust. It's almost like women never struggle with that. But men, you know, you're eye creatures. And so check yourselves on lust and, and rightfully so. But we see in, in this, you know, Genesis 39 example uh, of, uh, of Sister Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar, who looked at Joseph and was like, lie with me. And so, you know, here, obviously this, 
example of, of a woman who, whose lust led her to um, being bold um, in seeking to you know, allure Joseph. And then, of course, we see the, the power of Joseph's no of honoring God and, and the way that that led with his yeah. story. So I, I saw something online where um, Kobe Bryant, they've been doing a lot of Kobe Bryant memes and different things because I think we're coming to, this is birthday or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they showed a, a, a short meme of him. He was on the court playing and Halle Berry was one of the fans sitting courtside. And the, the meme focused on how she was lusting after Kobe Bryant, that if looks could undress, not kill, but if looks could undress, Halle Berry was undressing and looking like she wanted to actually eat Kobe Bryant for dinner. And uh, and they showed it. And so again, the, the culture typically says that men are the ones who lust, but women lust as well. Um, and, and here's something, Doreen, I want you to hit on. You talked about how in this age, men and women get objectified because of their appearance. And usually in the Christian world, especially the conservative Christian world, it's always the onus is put on the woman to dress properly. Because if a woman dresses properly or modestly, I should say, then that will help a man not to lust after her. So, so do you remember when we were talking about this this past yes, week? Yes. What and, to say about that? And we we were just rem being reminded that you know some of that culture and, and those conversations were about power. Mm. They were about um, bashing women. They were um, being patriarchal in a way that dishonored women, um, and and that women are not at fault for men. Um, you know, assaulting and abusing and raping and, and lusting and all of that, that it's not a woman's responsibility. Now, we also talked about how, um, you know, when people go to you know strip clubs or certain places for certain things that um, the people who are there, you know, encouraging it are dressed in a certain way. If y'all catch my drift, not to go down that route, but there is a place for talking, frankly, about what it means to dress in a way that is intending to be alluring. So that's one thing. But this whole blanket, like, you know, well, it's almost like men are going to struggle. Men are going to be men kind of thing like that. That's where we have to check ourselves and consider, are we being more impacted by culture or more impacted by Christian teaching that's not biblical teaching. So even some of our Christian culture. So we, it, it's just a reminder for all of us. We yeah. try to keep equal yeah. opportunity to keep our radars up. If we can bash, 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 just one thing. Yeah. And again, then we're over here, you know, putting women down and making them feel like they got to walk around with yeah. a pillowcase. Wow, we got to go, but this is yeah. good. This um, is good. Two things. In Jesus' culture, women were very modest because by and large, they were covered, very well covered. But being covered doesn't stop what goes on in a man's mind. A man, a man can imagine. So he doesn't always have to see cleavage or things like that. You know, it, it's in a man's mind, a man's heart. Um, and I, I like how you also said that um, whether a woman's covered or not, or if she wears something that um, um, causes her figure, what was the word you used? Where, where she looks good with a certain kind of, dress on or top on. It's not meant to make men stumble, but it's something that uh, causes her, what was the word? It wasn't accentuate. It was a word you used to promote a woman's natural beauty that she has mm -hmm. when she wears certain garments. It, she, she's not wearing it, you know, to, to, to try and cause men to stumble, but she's wearing something that- uh, uh, In confidence with her, her figure. That compliments yeah, her figure. Her figure. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So so it's that kind of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's different for every woman. And there's some women, I remember hearing Mary Mary talk about um, Tamala Mann, that she, she, she mm, I'm in trouble. She, she, she's a uh, woman with hips. Full figured woman. Full figured woman. Thank you, babe. And, uh, and so there are things she wears that they're tight. And so is she being immodest or is that, you know, just a challenge for women who are full figured. Wow, you know, it's just different. It's tough. It's not easy. There's no law, no no one thing that people can live by. 
And that's where legalism comes in, where right. you take that's right. your convictions and put them off on other people. And if they don't use them, you judge them. Make a standard of righteousness Ooh. dressing like women can't wear pants because that's, uh -oh. you know. So, and again, check ourselves. Let's check ourselves. Let's close up with number, your third point, the lesson to be <laughs> learned. <laughs> From Matthew 5, 29 through 30. Let me read it. Oh, and Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now you said, you talked beautifully about how Jesus was using hyperbole. He was not advocating for self-mutilation because we know some people have tried to use this scripture to to mutilate themselves, like, oh, Jesus said, cut my eye out. So. Or, or it's like monks building a monastery in the woods and moving to a monastery to escape the world and realize the world came with them to the monastery because the world is in them. So so you can try to cut stuff off and, you know, but, but it's still in you. So you got to be careful again about rigid asceticism. And that is again, making these laws. So, you know, to try to help me be holy, where holiness is a matter of the heart. That's where that's where it begins and it overflows into how we live our lives. And so he's just trying to say, look, there are some decisions you're going to have to make. Um, things that you're going to have to decide to do now if you're in a marriage or you're messing with someone in a marriage that, that you need to cut off now so that it doesn't give you hellfire later. Now, the hellfire here could speak of literal hell or figurative hell. But either way, it's hell because uh, I won't even get into that in terms of there was a dump in the area where they would dump garbage. And so um, that was a word in that day used for our word of hell, this burning garbage dump. Uh, and so some people even use that to say there's not a literal hell. But no, no, no. Again, Jesus would use metaphors and illustrations that people in this day understood where you burn garbage at Gehenna that was known as hell. And there was a literal hell as well that was created for Satan and his demons. That again, people go there who live like this, mm -hmm. the scriptures say. So this is not something to play with as far as a lifestyle of adultery. Not someone who commits adultery, but someone who lives a lifestyle of breaking this command. You got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. So what changes do you need to make? We talked about, man, to, to, to help keep yourself upright. Maybe you need to deal with your cell phone. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to change your number. Um, you got to stop calling people who are trouble. Um, you know, your, 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 your cable television, you, you know, you got to watch what you're watching. Uh, we also talked about conversations that we have mm -hmm. with people mm -hmm. that, that may start innocent, but then begin to turn in a way that's not healthy. And, and you get into something where your emotions are in it and, and you create what is called a soul tie with someone you're not married to. And there's an emotional connection. You're even trying to connect spiritually, talking about we pray together. Well, I guess there's some things y'all ain't praying about because man, again, it's very subtle how this stuff can happen. And Jesus said, man, you got to cut stuff off. Yeah. You got to pluck stuff out. Otherwise, it's going to cost you more than you could ever imagine. So um, how do we apply this? Because if you're not dealing with it now, that doesn't mean you won't deal with it later. So let a man who thinks he's standing take heed lest he fall. And so when the fires of lust hit us, uh, uh, we got to know how to say flame off. Just like the human torch we talked about on Sunday. Got to say flame off. No, man, this is not going to consume me and, and destroy my life or my marriage covenant. That was a great illustration too. Flame on, flame on. <laughs> That was great. All right, let's get into some questions. First question we're gonna jump into. What is the first step one should take to get healed or delivered from the LGBT lifestyle that we can tell those who seek our godly opinion, support, and help? What does the process look like for LGBT people who want to no longer engage in that sin? Wow. So if someone, whoever- Be Before you answer this, I just wanna say again, we do not know who sends these in. Um, when uh, our assistant, the Strong Tower, hands me the questions, no one knows who these folks are, who you are. So again, you are protected. 
So just feel free to send these questions in and we have no idea who's sending these in. Mm -hmm. And they come from all across the country, mm -hmm. not just in, in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. Um, so I would, I would offer for a person who's, you know, wanting to get healed, delivered from this, that, you know, step one is the same step for any of us with any sin that we've been overcome with. Um, or that we're struggling with, whether, no matter where they are in terms of living that lifestyle or just lusting or desire, um, to repent. That's always step one is to repent. And repenting means to, to verbalize to God what it is, and then it's to make a, a complete turnaround. So it's not just words, but it's word and action. So mm. it's turning away from. And the mm. beautiful thing is that when you're turning from something, you're always turning to something. Amen. So you're turning to the Lord. And I, I think it also speaks to those of us who may not be struggling with this particular sin issue that we have our own. And so, you know, this is a great question for all of us to consider if someone else is struggling. But repent is step one, turning away from, turning towards Christ. Before you go on, babe, can I hit this? Because you, you said something that made me think of something. Where he says uh, about fleeing mm -hmm. youthful lusts mm -hmm. in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also you for lust. Mm -hmm. So run from it. Don't play with it. Mm -hmm. But pursue righteousness, yes. faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So you got to be with somebody. Well, that was one of, we were, were thinking alike. Oh. Because I was going to also encourage you, oh. particularly with, um, with this issue. It is so important for you to be in community. And y'all, one of the things that is encouraging me the most as we have dived into this important and relevant topic of sexuality is that God has been fostering community. Um, it really brings me to tears because there's beautiful community available for you um, of people who um, have either lived that lifestyle and have repented and are walking in purpose, not perfectly, not without honest struggles, but it's a wonderful gap. Just like someone whose struggle is you know, man, I keep being tempted with alcohol. Well, it's good to be able to talk with other people who can relate where you know you're not the only one. You're not alone. When you're tempted and you feel like I'm going to give in, that you know, you know, whether it's a mentor or someone who's older than you or mentorship doesn't just mean age. It just may mean older in wisdom or farther down the path than you are. So it's so important um, for you to have those wisdom resources. And again, one of the reasons we offer out, you know, wonderful organizations like Revoice, like um, uh, I'll think of some of the others later and we'll continue to share these, but it's because community is available for um, for people who are wanting to turn away. Um, and I'm grateful to continue to hear those testimonies of mm -hmm. folks who that is their story, that they have made that turn. So for those who say it's not possible or, well, that's just the way that they are, they just need to live in their truth, um, you know, God's truth reigns. And so um, this is such an important question to whoever asked it. I'm grateful um, that they asked it. And it's a, an opportunity for all of us to be prepared wow. to be able to help guide and usher people. Uh, you you stop in the night. I like that. You talk about that, your truth stuff. Because sometimes our truth is a lie or it's so emotionally driven and experientially driven that it contradicts scripture. Mm. And we just got to be careful. Um, but repenting community. Yes. Because community will bring about accountability. Yes, yes. Someone accountability checking so on important. you. And you mm -hmm. checking on them. Iron sharpening iron. We, we can't do it by ourselves. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4 it says two are better than one. For if one falls, the other is there to pick him up. But woe to the person who falls and there's no one there. To pick him up. So you got to have somebody. I remember in college that uh, the guys and I, you know, we started getting serious about our walk. You know, we just started holding each other accountable on the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Magazine. Oh, yeah, Christian college now. When that Sports Illustrated Swimsuit thing came out, we go in the grocery store and you look around, you know, so you can go in here and, and sin and, and lust after these women. But again, when we started getting serious in college, we were like, hey, man, let's hold each other accountable. And we would tell each other what our struggles were. We would tell each other what our tendencies were. And so the other brothers were there to lovingly hold us, hold one another accountable. 
My God. So that's what it takes. Posture Shift is one of the other organizations that I love yeah. because of the focus on love, the focus on church being a healthy and safe space for people who um, whose struggle is, is you know, same-sex attraction um, or in that lifestyle. And so. before someone gets critical, accountability for me was just not back there. I have accountability now. I have men in my life who hold me accountable for how I live my life as pertains to sexual purity. Guys who I can talk to when I'm struggling, when I'm tempted, when I fail. I have people in my life and I'm in their life. So you got to get people in your life. Amen. Second question, second question. Hundreds of animal species are able to change their sex from male to female. We're speaking of loads of fish and frogs and butterflies. Why do we openly accept God making other animals like this, but then say that for humans, it's strictly black and white? That is, humans are not to change their sex or gender that was given at birth. Did you get the question? If animals can change gender, why can't humans? Pastor Chris, what say you? <laughs> well, I did a little bit of research. I'm not a zoologist or a biologist, but I did a little research. A small percentage of animals can change their genders, a small percentage. And some species come with simultaneously functioning female and male organs. About 2% of fish species display some kind of hermaphroditism. So about 2% of fish species have same sex uh, about them. That's what a hermaphrodite is. Well, when male clownfish change into female clownfish, they do it if the female clownfish dies. So I did some reading, and so you have two mature fish within a school, and uh, you have a, a, a mature male and a mature female. And if for some reason the female dies or is taken, then that uh, uh, male can transfer into a female clownfish, and the next mature male within the school comes up to mate with that particular fish. So, so that is possible within the clownfish species. Now, species are able to change genders. Species that are able to do that are able to do it. Listen to this. This is me being Chris without the aid of surgery. Okay. Ooh, okay. And, and once changed from male to female, they have the capacity to spawn little fish or babies, whereas that doesn't happen with humans, okay? Well, God created some species with the ability to fly. God created some species with the ability to live in water. Some can uh, fly and then dip in the water, but they can't stay in the water. Or fish can jump out of the water and fly for a second, but come back down into the water. What's the point? God didn't create all animals with the ability to do the same thing. Did you hear that? He didn't create the animals with the ability to do the same thing. There is beauty in their diversity. Therefore, to expect one set of animals to do what others do is a ridiculous notion. Um, animals, uh, 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 lions do not do what clownfish do. So if you want to see lions do what clownfish do, that, that is a ridiculous notion. And rare exceptions should never be viewed as the norm. Okay, again, it's a small percentage of, fit, of, of, of animals that can do this, that can change genders. Well, in rare cases, humans can be born as hermaphrodites, possessing male and female genitalia. It is estimated that up to 1.7% of the population has an intersex trait, and that approximately 0.5% of people have clinically identifiable sexual or reproductive variations. When this rare phenomenon occurs, it's up to the parents to choose the gender of the child based on medical counsel. Okay, so again, this is very, very rare um, when hermaphrodites are born. God didn't give humans the ability to fly like birds. 
He didn't give humans the ability to live in water like fish. He didn't give humans the ability to naturally change genders like some species can. Neither did God give animals the ability to communicate rationally, rationally with God and one another through speech and comprehension. In other words, God didn't give everybody the same abilities. Because we're made in the image of God, animals are not, we can communicate rationally with God and God with us. That is not the case with animals. We can communicate rationally and use speech with one another. Animals cannot do that. And so therefore some animals, they even eat their young. <laughs> We're not to do that. <laughs> we cannot forget that it was God who sent land animals and birds two by two into the ark, one male, one female, so that they could procreate and replenish the earth after the flood. So again, we stick with the ideal of male and female, even in the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. where it's rare that uh, species will um, change genders. But just because it happens there, that doesn't mean it's supposed to happen with humans. Uh, and when it does happen with humans in our day and age, where a man becomes a woman, it is done through a surgical procedure. Whereas in the animal kingdom, it is a natural uh, procedure, if you will. So I hope I answered that question. Um, I honestly think people are reaching if they try to use that as a means to say, well, why can't humans be transsexual when we see that happening in uh, certain species in the animal kingdom? Yeah, small, minority. small, small number. That's good. Very good. All right. Um, next question. Assuming uh -oh. you use the typical six or seven passages that refer to sexual immorality as a basis for your understanding of homosexuality in the Bible. How does your understanding compare to others who read the same passages and come to different conclusions? Why do others read those passages and understand them as a warning against violent, predatory, or culturally inappropriate behavior as opposed to a blanket condemnation for homosexuality? <laughs> there, are, there are three questions <laughs> in this question. Um, I'll try to take them one by one. So the person who sent this in says, um, I'm going to assume you use the typical six or seven passages that refer to sexual immorality as a basis for my understanding of homosexuality in the Bible. Um, so I wrote some notes. So let, let, let me read what I wrote. I've never counted the quote unquote typical mm. proof texts that speak against homosexuality. I, I've never counted. My guess is, is that it's more than six or seven, okay? <laughs> but I've never counted. And, uh, and if I were talking to this person in person, I would ask them, um, can you find for me one text from scripture that clearly promotes homosexuality as an acceptable lifestyle, okay? Sometimes you got to answer questions with a question. Jesus would do that. Amen. You answer Amen. questions with a question. So I would ask, as you say, that I have the six or seven typical biblical texts that speak against homosexuality. I would want to know, can you show me at least one clear text from scripture that promotes homosexuality? I haven't read that yet, because when I read the scriptures and it speaks of immorality, with specific emphasis on homosexuality, it's never written in a positive light, ever. So that may lead to why the second question comes up, maybe even the third one. Um, how does your understanding compare to others who disagree? Because we've gotten this question quite a few times. Um, how do you know you're right? Um, there's a whole lot of good people who disagree with you. Um, what about them? Well, one question I have is, do you go and ask them the questions that you're asking me? Do you ask them, in other words, how do y'all know y'all are right? If you uh, are a church or a pastor that affirms homosexuality, uh, are you asking them the way you're asking me? <laughs> Usually it's not that way. 
But I digress. Let me go on. Knowing that other people interpret scripture differently than I do and come to a different conclusion that I come to, it doesn't faze me. It doesn't faze me that people have different views. Man, they, they can have their view just like I can have mine. And here's the thing about views. Both views, when they're opposite, both views can be false, but they both can't be true. <laughs> One of them is true and the other is false, assuming we're operating on sound biblical teaching. Um, everybody can't be right, but everybody can be wrong. OK. Ah, OK, Pastor Chris, where are you going with this? Um, this is not new because anyone can misuse the Bible and you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. So just quoting the Bible is not good enough, okay? Um, because it can be misquoted. It can be quoted out of context. So just because someone is promoting a view, that doesn't mean that view is right because they have scripture um, supporting their view, if you will. So Pastor Chris, how do you know you're right? Well, I thank God I'm not the judge, capital J. Amen. Jesus is the judge. And, and there'll come a day where we're all going to find out who's right. <laughs> OK, so we should all, uh, as the Bible says, in the book of James 3, 1, that those who teach are under stricter judgment, stricter judgment by God for how we handle his word or mishandle it and how we handle or mishandle his people. I hope whoever asked this question knows I've heard you say this and I hope some of y'all can win. You said this over and over and over about being under stricter judgment. I just wanted to just- Yeah, James 3, 1. There. As a reminder, and I don't say this because I live with you and I'm biased, but like you are always aware of the fact that you are under stricter judgment. So you don't take your stands lightly. You don't speak forth um, your convictions based on the word of God, based on yeah. years and hours of sweat and Bible study. You don't speak those things casually or lightly. And in fact, you have such a high view of scripture and a reverence for God. And yeah. so I just wanted to intercept that because you literally said that over and over and over. So I'm not sure if whoever's yeah. asking this maybe hasn't heard you say it and maybe yeah. in time we'll get other questions and it's like, okay, have they not heard you say that? But yeah. you say it over and, and over. And that's why, and what I also say over and over again is the goal is sound teaching. Correct. It's not perfect teaching because none of us have perfect teaching. Watch this. A text of scripture can never mean what it never meant. So the goal of an expositor or an interpreter is to try his or her best to understand what the passage meant in its original context by the original author to the original audience. We're, we're going back to try to understand as best we can a sound understanding of that. But because I wasn't there, I can't even know, you know, exclusively what it means. So again, a sound understanding. Because watch this, over in 2 Peter, Peter said that the things Paul was writing about, they're hard to understand. Wow. So if another apostle said that about another apostle who lived together in the first century, that what this brother is writing in the book of Romans and all this stuff, it's hard to understand. We can't think, man, we know exactly what he meant. So cheer we're, up, cheer up. <laughs> we're trying to get a sound understanding, a balanced understanding with the whole, because the Bible's not going to contradict itself. If there's a contradiction, it's not with the Bible, it's with me, it's with us. So what does it mean? Here's an example. When Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, Satan, the liar, the father of lies came to him and said, turn these stones into bread, if you are the son of God. He, he's wanting Jesus to prove himself. So he's like, man, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then uh, Satan says, oh, you like to quote scripture. So the next time he tempts Christ, he takes him up to the top of the temple and says to Jesus, it is written. Uh, if you cast yourself down, that the angels will catch you before you dash your feet on the stone. The devil quoted Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. Why? Because Jesus quoted scripture. So now he's like, okay, Jesus, you want to quote scripture? I'll quote scripture. But when he quoted scripture, he quoted scripture out of context. He was quoting it to use it for his own selfish means when that was not what that psalm was written for in terms of uh, uh, the Messiah jumping off of the top of the temple. 
I was talking about God taking care of his people in Psalm 91, okay, about angels protecting God's people. Uh, but, but the devil knows the Bible. He knows the Bible well enough to quote it right there, but he also knows it well enough to quote it out of context on purpose to try to get Jesus to, to trip up. So what did Jesus say? He responded to the devil by saying, it is also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So as a believer who's growing as a disciple of Christ, we need to know what is written and we need to know what is also written. Because just because someone comes along quoting scripture doesn't mean they know what they're talking about, which is why we always say at Strong Tower Bible Church, you have the right to check us based on scripture if what we're saying is not in line with scripture. We hold ourselves accountable to God, to his word, and to the people of God, okay? Uh, so if we get something wrong, we'll say something, because there's a difference between a false teacher and a teacher who every now and then says something that's false, you know? So if we say something false, come check us on it so we can correct it. But then there are false teachers out here. I know I'm saying a lot, but my man, let me keep on rolling. Uh, um, differences are nothing new as far as how we see the Bible. This is why denominations have gotten started. Denominations have gotten started over things like baptism. Some denominations baptize infants. Some denominations don't. Some denominations baptize in Jesus' name. Some denominations baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there are differences under the umbrella of Christendom. There are differences about eternal security. Some believers think you can't lose your salvation. Other denominations believe you can. Uh, there are denominations who believe that uh, once you get the Holy Ghost, the evidence is speaking in tongues. Other denominations don't believe that when you get the Holy Spirit. And so, so there are going to be differences under the umbrella of Christianity. But then there are differences outside of Christianity where people misuse the Bible. Mormons misuse the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses misuse the Bible. Muslims misuse the Bible. So this is why, again, we've got to know what the Bible says. And there are gay affirming churches. Uh, one of the questions, uh, uh, are they true churches? Again, it's not up for me to judge and for me to decide that. I'm not the, the head of the church. I'm a pastor. I have a perspective, but I'm not the judge. I will say this, though. If you read the book of Revelation, chapters two and three, it talks about the seven churches of Asia Minor that existed towards the last half of the first century, where Jesus has a word to say to each one of those seven churches. Two of the churches were commended. Five of those seven churches were rebuked. One of those churches that was rebuked, he talks about their doctrine being off. And Jesus says, I hate their doctrine. And, and in these churches, man, there's all kind of sexual immorality that accompanies bad doctrine. Read it for yourself. Sexual immorality accompanies bad doctrine. And so, uh, so, so there are churches that have bad doctrine. But here's what I love about Jesus. He gave those churches that had bad doctrine a chance to, what Doreen said earlier, repent. Repent. Stop teaching that stuff. Uh, Jezebel had a seat in one church. The devil had a throne in a particular church. The Nicolaitans were doing stuff that Jesus hated and they were teaching stuff that Jesus hated. Jesus hated their doctrine and their deeds, but he gave all of them a chance to repent. So if they're a true Christian and if those are true churches, they will repent of having taught bad stuff, demonic stuff, sexually immoral stuff. Uh huh. So, 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 yeah, man. Ah, boy. Again, that, that, that's just so. And, and let me say this last thing on this because there are people who will say, What's my time? Paul knew the Greek culture that he was living in, he knew about the Roman culture. And in that culture, homosexuality was common. So when Paul would speak against homosexual behavior, to many of these Greeks who had become Christians, these Hellenistic uh, folks who believed in the whole Roman philosophies and all this stuff, when they became Christian, he was not putting down homosexual practice between two consenting same-sex adults. That's what people say. 
But what he was putting down in scripture was predatory or violent exchanges between men and men or women and women or men with boys. That, that when Paul spoke against quote unquote homosexuality, what he had in mind was that he was speaking against, against predatory examples or rape, incest, on and on, not against uh, platonic relationships between people of the same sex. And I just want to let you know, if you hold that view, you are in error. You're in error. And you need to repent of that view. In that view, you are committing what is called eisegesis. Eisegesis is when you read things into the Bible that are not there. Exegesis is when we read things out, bring things out of the Bible that are there. You're not going to find that in the Bible. You've got to leave the Bible to make a point about the Bible that's not in the Bible and that is inconsistent with the Bible. All right, let me hit you with this because you may not be feeling me. Before Paul got converted, what was he? He was a committed, highly religious and zealous kosher Jew in every way. Very pious Jew. He gets born again, mm -hmm. still has a commitment for God. And he's leading Gentiles to faith in Jesus Christ. There are Jews in Paul's day who they've come to Christ, but they're still holding on to Moses, the law of Moses. So there was a fight, a contention in Acts chapter 15 between the Jews and the apostles and Paul and Barnabas because they felt that these Gentiles need to accept the law as they accept Jesus. And Paul was like, no, they don't. Peter stood up and said, we're not placing on them a yoke that we couldn't carry or that our ancestors couldn't carry. People are not saved by keeping the law. They're saved by trusting in Jesus Christ. So a decision was made by the Jerusalem church and the apostles to not put the law on Gentiles. But what the apostles did say was, here's what we want you to encourage the Gentiles to do. Do not eat meat sacrificed to idols, because we know many of you Gentiles are in, in these um, places worshiping Aphrodite, the goddess of love. We, we know you're in these places eating things sacrificed to demons. We want y'all to stop that stuff and uh, stay away from things that are strangled. And then they also say to place on these Gentiles that they abstain from sexual immorality. Paul did not say, now hold on now, hold on, time out. Uh, um, they can have sex with other men as long as it's consensual, right? No, that wasn't even up for debate as a kosher religious Jewish person who understood what the Torah and the Talmud spoke about as pertains to same-sex relations. So for a Jewish person to accept what the Greeks were doing, that was not going to happen. So what the, the Jews did, who were the stewards of the gospel at this time, they had to tell Gentiles, y'all got to chill on that sexual immorality stuff. That was all of it. All of that stuff, whether it was consensual or predatory, that's not acceptable for a believer. So there's no way you're going to tell me that Paul, who held to a traditional uh, a sexual ethic as an unbelieving Jew, now, as a believing Jew is going to write to the Corinthians and tell them that it's okay to have same-sex relationships as long as it's consented. That's not in the book. Stop reading that mess into the Bible to support your agenda. But what you do see him saying to the church at Corinth, oh my, what you do see him saying, I'm going to close on this, baby, and then let you, oh, Lord, man. Come on, y'all. When the plain sense of scripture makes sense, seek no other sense. Amen. He says, uh, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know? Again, speaking to a church that's in a city that is highly immoral. Mm. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That means unrighteous folk don't go to heaven. Do not be deceived then and now. Neither fornicators. In other words, if you practice fornication, you ain't going to heaven. Nor idolaters. If you practice idolatry, you're not going to heaven. 
uh, 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 nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. So that, that, that has that covered, right? Homosexuals, platonic relationship, sodomites, a violent, abusive kind of thing going on, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So again, it comes back to repentance. It's got to be a change. Jesus puts a change in you. But here it is. And he says, and such were some of you. Such were some of you. Were. Mm -hmm. That's what you used to Absence. be. There's the hope. There's the hope. There's the salvation. That's the message of Jesus that he came to seek and save the lost. Such were some of you. You had a before and now you have an after. He says, uh, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So he didn't compromise the gospel because he was in a town full of compromise. And that's how churches get messed up. When a little leaven seeps into a church and it spreads through a church and now everybody's compromising the moral standard of God. And when people stand up against it, oh, you're not being sensitive or you're homophobic or you're bashing you're, people. You hate people. I just want to be a part of love. Yeah. No, man. Well, final. Let's just, your preview. Next week, you are covering modern day units from ni Matthew 19, 1 through 12. So one, one second, babe. Can you read those comments? Read them oh, real quick. Yes, we, yes, we got yes. some good comments. So that that's a preview. Out. It's coming up. We're not going to give any more of that. We're going to close with the comments. Someone said, I want to thank you for teaching this series. We have family members who attend your church that have gotten scripture twisted like you preached on August 14th. I am praying diligently for them to see the truth and repent. And we mm. join that prayer. Someone else said that point about noticing beauty in others does not mean one is homosexual needs to be emphasized and reiterated, especially for this younger generation. Say that again, Pastor Chris. Amen. 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 Um, and then the final comment, that was by far one of the best messages um, on lust I've ever heard. The sensitivity, humor, and scriptural integrity while also addressing our humanity was on point. Amen. Amen. Yeah, Amen. some of us just, just need to come back to solid hermeneutics, which is the way you interpret the Bible. Yeah. We need to get back to exegesis, that is interpreting scripture with scripture pulling truth out of scripture as opposed to eisegesis, reading stuff into the Bible. Again, this is why we, we have to have Bible study. And this is why we all need pastors and leaders and teachers to help us because we're like sheep. We go astray. We need shepherds, under shepherds. But above all, above all, above all, above all, we have the chief shepherd, the good shepherd. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's given us not only his word, but his spirit. And we have an anointing from God who can teach us things that no man or woman can teach us. But if we can get into the book objectively and just read the scriptures and let the plain sense talk to us, we're going to make some changes. Because a lot of us, we're more concerned with trying to bend the scriptures to accommodate people who refuse to bend their will to God. I am not one that's gonna bend this scripture to accommodate you. You must bend your will because this word is not going to change. And yes, God loves you, but he is not going to change his word for you. He's not going to change it for me. He didn't change it for Jonah. He's not going to change it for us. We must change to the word. I know it doesn't feel good or sound good, but it's right. It's right. Amen. Ah, so this Sunday, Modern Day Unix, we want a good time. Talking about that. Oh, All right, y'all. I'm going to close this in prayer. Father, ooh, thank you, Jesus, that you are the Savior. Thank you that that was your mission to seek and to save the lost. And we acknowledge that the gospel is not just for those people who don't know Jesus. The gospel is for us who know you, Jesus. It's for us to be reminded that you are the Savior. Lord, for some of us who are trying to save our friends and save our family and save um this culture at large, Lord, to be reminded that that's not our job, that you are the Savior, but we are to speak the truth in love. Um, so, Lord, I thank you for your love that binds us in, in perfect unity. I thank you for your love that sacrificed. I thank you for your love that calls us to deny ourselves and take up your cross and follow you. I pray that you would call us back to that sacrifice of what that means, Lord. 
Um, I pray that we would take this word tonight and that we would, um, Lord, just let it simmer in our hearts, Lord, that we would meditate on it, that it would cause us to get even deeper into studying your word, Lord, to show ourselves approved so that we can be students of the word, that we can understand God in this crooked and perverse generation, um, Lord, the light and the life that you have come to bring and that you call us to be. So we bless you, God, for this night. I pray that you would bless everyone under the sound of our voices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Please say a prayer for me and for Darina tonight. Um, I'm sure you can imagine the kind of warfare we come under because we dare to put on the arm of God and take a stand and speak the truth in love. Um, but there's a lot of resistance that comes. It's expected. Uh, we endure hardship as good soldiers of Jesus. But man, the devil does not fight fair and he does anything he can to discourage us. But I believe with the prayers of God's people, uh, uh, man, we, we always prevail. So pray for us as we do this work. All right, y'all be blessed.